Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello, I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living the Word is a teaching program, and we are working our way through the book of Isaiah. But as we work our way through the book of Isaiah, of course, the Spirit of God sends us all over the Bible, because the whole Bible is whole. And so pieces are put together for us uh, to learn, to truly learn what our God wants to say to us right now. And so let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is indeed a beautiful day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Heavenly Father, now that we are gathered around your word, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would indeed uh, take into ourself this word, and we pray that the seed of your word would take root and grow and bear fruit in our lives. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday we heard that God does not want us to go through the motions of our faith. The Lord doesn't want us to give him lip service. He wants our full devotion. We also heard how Israel's king was determined to depend on Egypt for protection when Egypt had no strength to protect and save. Flesh cannot deliver protection unless the Lord is at work in and through a person or army or nation. But the Lord was not working through Egypt. The Lord had not told Israel that he was working through Egypt to help and deliver them. The fact was that Israel wasn't even consulting the Lord. They were not calling on the one who could deliver them. They did not understand the power and might of the Lord. They should have. If any nation on earth should have been able to uh, understand the power and might of the Lord, it should have been Israel. Hadn't the Lord delivered them over and over again? And hadn't, they, hadn't the Lord protected him over and over again? And hadn't the Lord provided for them over and over again? Yes, he had. And yes, he would. The same is true for us. If we consider our lives, if we look back on how the Lord has protected us and provided for us and delivered us, isn't it reasonable to think that God will continue to protect, provide, and deliver us? Now, some of the time, we must wait on the Lord for his deliverance. Now, here is... Here is where some of us really get challenged. Waiting on the Lord isn't easy. We live in a world and we live in a culture where we can get our needs and our wants met without waiting for them. So we have become accustomed to instant gratification. And this is not a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I like fast food restaurants. I like microwaves. I like computers and so forth. But growing and maturing in the Lord cannot be accomplished quickly. In fact, it is God's desire that we grow uh, and continue to grow until we reach maturity in Christ. And that isn't going to happen for a very long time. The sad fact is, many Christians are satisfied with where they are in their faith, and they don't see any reason to keep growing up in Christ. Now, would any of us be satisfied if an infant remained an infant, none of us would be satisfied with that. God's desire is that we become like Christ. One of the distinguishing characteristics of a mature Christian is that the fruit of the Spirit is mature within them. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are these fully mature in any of us? If these were fully mature in every believer, the church would not look like it does today. It would look quite different than it does now. And the church would have a much bigger and much greater impact on the world than it does now. Now, neither you nor I can will the fruit of the Spirit to grow and mature in us. 
but we can ask the Lord to work in us to bring about the maturing of this fruit. The question is always one of, will we? Will we go to our God, to the master potter, and ask him to mature the fruit of his spirit within us? He will, if we are willing. Maturing in Christ Jesus, again, is not automatic. It is going to take our cooperation with God, and it truly is a lifelong process. In our fast-paced, instant gratification world, let's be determined to let God accomplish whatever he will in us, no matter how long it will take. We also heard yesterday that God's people were saying to the seers, see no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. The truth is convicting. Many people do not want to face the truth. We might have to change. Yet, it is truly only the truth that can set us free. Many people argue that perception is reality. Not so. Truth is reality. My perception and your perception can be clouded and skewed by all kinds of self-interest. But truth has no bias. Truth simply is. Let's not be the people who live with the attitude, I've made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. No, let's be willing to listen to truth, regardless of whether it is contrary to what we think. In Isaiah 30, we heard that Israel was relying on oppression and deceit. These would do nothing for them. This was sin, and it would not be able to support them. However, the Lord told his people what they needed to do. He told them, in repentance and rest is your strength. In repentance and rest is your salvation, and quietness and trust is your strength. We do not generally think of repentance and rest, quietness and trust, as being sources of salvation and strength, but they are. The strength of our life and our salvation is not found in us. It is not found in what we do or in who we are. The strength of our lives is in the Lord. Our salvation, our salvation is in God. This is the consistent message of God through the prophets. Over and over again, we hear the Lord urge his people to trust him. Unfortunately, time and time again, they did not. But when they did, God did amazing things for them. In Isaiah 31, beginning at verse 8, the Lord through Isaiah declared to his people, Assyria will fall by a sword that is not of man, a sword not of mortals, will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put to forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At the sight of, bat of the battle standard, their commanders will panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Now these words of Isaiah take us back to 2 Kings 19, when Sennacherib had threatened Jerusalem through the blasphemous words of his battle commander. Let's return to 2 Kings 19 to hear what the Lord told Hezekiah's servants through Isaiah. Beginning at verse 6, Isaiah to the, said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says, Do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I am going to put such a spirit in him that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country and there I will have him cut down with the sword. And then jumping to verse 32 of the same chapter, therefore this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David my servant. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adramelech and Sherezer cut him down with a sword and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Isarhaddon, his son succeeded him as king. Hezekiah had put his trust in the Lord, and the Lord delivered his people. 
Who in the world can argue with the results God gets? Why then are we so quick to go our own way? Oh God, deliver us from ourselves. The Lord continues to bring good news to his people in Isaiah 32. See, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. And the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fools speak folly. His mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. The hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withdraws water. The scoundrel's methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. But the noble man makes noble plans and by noble deeds he stands. Verse 9, we hear this. You women who are complacent, rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, hear what I have to say. In a little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. The great harvest will fail, and the harvest of fruit will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes. Put sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and, and briars. Yes, mourn for all the houses of merriment and for this city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever. The delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks. Till the spirit is poured upon us from on high and the desert becomes a fertile field and the fertile field seems like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert and righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Though hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely, how blessed you will be, sowing your seed by every stream and letting your cattle and donkeys range free. Does God detest complacency or what? It generally takes a disaster of some, t some kind to get a complacent person to move. And the reason for this is that they're complacent. The dictionary describes complacency and complacent as pleased, especially with oneself or one's merits, advantages, situation, often without awareness of some potential danger or defect, self-satisfied. It is tough to get someone to move if they are satisfied with the way things are. The trouble with complacency is that the complacent are often unaware of potential dangers that may be coming their way because they cannot imagine trouble actually coming their way. Complacency among God's people at any time is not good. The trouble is, is that we become complacent so easily. Let's understand that we need to be aware of our tendency to become complacent and be on guard against it at all times. Complacency is not a spiritual strength. It is not a fruit of the Spirit. The trouble being prophesied to God's people in Jerusalem was going to come upon them. And it was going to come and last until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high and the desert becomes a fertile field and the fertile field seems like a forest. Only then could God's people expect the promises Isaiah was also prophesying would come. And those promises were justice will dwell in the desert and righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. 
Listen to that. Let's listen. The fruit, the outcome of righteousness is peace. Not war, it is peace. Not disconcerting anxious minds. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. It's because the righteous have nothing to fear. Isaiah 33. Woe to you, O destroyer, you who have not been destroyed. Woe to you, O traitor, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. O Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. At the thunder of your voice, the people flee. When you rise up, the nations scatter. You plunder, O nations. Your plunder, O nations, is harvested as by young locusts. Like a swarm of locusts, men pounce on it. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Now, Isaiah isn't saying anything that hasn't already been said and taught to God's people. Solomon, king of Israel, after his father David and writer of the book of Ecclesiastes, devoted himself to study and explore by wisdom all that is under heaven. He increased and he increased in wisdom. He grew in wisdom more than anybody who had ruled over Jerusalem. So he sought to understand wisdom and madness and folly. He sought to understand that. He undertook great projects. He had male and female slaves, more flocks and herds than anyone before him. He had singers and a harem and many wives. And in the end, after Solomon had learned all that he could by wisdom, he came to this conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. What does it mean that we are to fear God? It means that we are to revere him. We are to honor him. We are to adore him. It means we are to stand in awe of him. It means we are to respect him. He is our God. He is our creator. He's the one who made us. And we honor him because he is worthy of all honor. Sure, some of the times when people got into the presence of the Lord, they shook with fear. The kind of afraid fear. But the fear that Solomon was talking about here. Fear God and keep his commandments. He was saying revere the Lord. Hold him high up in your uh, minds and in your hearts and in your lives and your spirit. You know, he's got the top spot. Fear him. Honor him. Adore him. Stand in awe of him. Let's continue reading Isaiah 33. Look, their brave men cry aloud in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. The highways are deserted. No travelers are on the roads. The treaty is broken. Its witnesses are despised. No one is respected. The land mourns and wastes away. Lebanon is ashamed and withers. Sharon is like the Arabah and Bashan and Carmel drop their leaves. Now will I arise, says the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I be lifted up. You conceive chaff. You give birth to straw. Your breath is a fire that consumes you. The peoples will be burned as if to lime. Like cut thorn bushes, they will be set ablaze. You who are far away, hear what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my power. The sinners of Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? And here's the answer. He who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion, 
and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemplating evil. This is the man who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. His bread will be supplied and water will not fail him. It would probably be a very good thing for all of us to ask the Lord to refine us and purge us of whatever will not be able to withstand God's refining fire. Now the refining process that the Lord will bring us through and take us through is never pleasant. It isn't pleasant. But it's for our good. And it is for the glory of God. Isaiah continues speaking of what God's people will see and ponder after the Lord does his work among them. Verse 17, your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. In your thoughts, you will ponder the former terror. Where is that chief officer? Where is the one who took the revenue? Where is the officer in charge of the towers? You will see those arrogant people no more, those people of an obscure speech with their strange and incomprehensible tongue. Look upon Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful abode, a tent that will not be moved. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its ropes broken. There the Lord will be our mighty one. It will be like a place of broad rivers and streams. No galley with oars will ride them. No mighty ship will sail them. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. Your rigging hangs loose. The mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. Then an abundance of spoils will be divided and even the lame will carry off plunder. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill. And the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. Let's ask ourselves the question today. What is more important to us? Forgiveness or healing? When we are sick or injured in some way, our answer is typically healing. But when we are convicted of sin and guilt, our answer is forgiveness. The two, however, belong together. Many people, in fact, are sick because of unforgiveness. When we do not forgive... Either ourselves or other people, unforgiveness becomes a poison in our bodies. Many diseases and ailments could be immediately healed if only people, people who harbor unforgiveness would forgive. Unforgiveness does not hurt the person we do not forgive, unless, of course, the, the relationship suffers. But unforgiveness hurts us. It always hurts us. The Lord Jesus came to heal us both spiritually and physically. We tend to discount the spiritual, but Jesus did not. Remember the paralytic whose friends had to dig a hole in the roof in order to lower him down to Jesus? No doubt they were lowering their friend down to Jesus so that he might heal the man of his paralysis. But Jesus did not address the paralysis first. No, he addressed the man's spiritual needs first. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Naturally, it's got the Pharisees and the teachers of the law all riled up. Who was this Jesus who thinks he can forgive sins? Only God can do that. That's what they were thinking to themselves. But Jesus knew what they were thinking, and so he asked, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, the man stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Does God care about our bodies? Does he care when we are ill or injured? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even so, the Lord is far more interested in our spiritual well-being. He cares if we are right with him, and so should we. If there are people we have not forgiven, then we must forgive them. We must forgive, or God will not forgive us. If there are people we have not forgiven, then our bodies may be aching, and we may be diseased because we have not forgiven. God has forgiven us all of our sins. 
As I have said before on previous programs, no one who sins against us, no matter how horrible they, have may, they may have sinned against us, cannot possibly come close to having sinned against us as much as we have sinned against God. God has forgiven us our entire debt against him. In response to God forgiving the entire debt we owed him, we are to forgive and completely forgive the entire debt of sin others commit against us. Isaiah 34. Come near, you nations, and listen. Pay attention, you peoples. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all that comes out of it. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is upon all their armies. He will totally destroy them, and he will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will send up a stench. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars of the heavens will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. My sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. See, it descends in judgment on Edom, the people I have totally destroyed. The sword of the Lord is bathed in blood. It is covered with fat, the blood of lambs and goats, fat from the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in Edom, and the wild oxen will fall with them, the bull calves and the great bulls. Their land will be drenched with blood, and the dust will be soaked with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a, a year of retribution, to uphold Zion's cause. And this is where we are going to stop today. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for who you are. Heavenly Father, you are righteous and you are just. And you had to and have to condemn sin, or else you would not be righteous, you would not be just. We thank you that you have put upon your son the punishment we deserved, the punishment we deserve. Heavenly Father, we pray that we might you know, totally rely on you, turn to you, trust in you, believe in you, not in other people, but in you. Heavenly Father, I pray that we might forgive as you have forgiven us. Because any other way is not your way. Because you have commanded us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Heavenly Father, you, you love each of the people who have been listening throughout this half hour. And I just bless them. I bless them, O oh Lord, with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining, Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known, and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love, and regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer, and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share or would like to purchase a CD of this message and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.